I think it's time to get this show on the road. <laughs> and I, I want to welcome everyone here. This is, of course, our alumni weekend. So if you're walking around and seeing and thinking that, gee, the students have gotten a little older lately. <laughs> They're not students, they're our past students, they're alums. Anyway, uh, this morning we had a jazz brunch and uh, it was really fun to see everyone who was at least, as you know, a kink or a pioneer. You know, for Peabody, they're pioneers. And so we got to see a lot of those pioneers and uh, unfortunately the weather uh, put a little damper on a few things. But anyway, I think one of the highlights of the weekend, of this whole weekend is what we're gonna experience right now. Uh, for many of you here, the person I'm introducing really needs no introduction. It's someone we work with day in and day out, and it's a dear friend. But I still, I think we owe him a nice introduction. As you can see, one of the things that endearing qualities about Rich is that he's very conscientious and hardworking. And do you notice how, the <laughs> how he's conscientious and hardworking up to the last minute of his talk? <laughs> Anyway, our lecturer today is Professor Rich Milner, who can really speak about the importance of Peabody's work in the field of education. And in recent uh, generations, America's urban classrooms have changed rapidly. I don't think I need to tell any of you in this room that. The demographic shifts have created a host of challenges for teachers, schools, and school systems. Students who come from lower socioeconomic conditions often start at a disadvantage that is difficult for schools to alone to ameliorate. Of course, that doesn't stop us from asking schools to fix problems that have their origins in other realms. And in America, these difficulties have long been intertwined with the questions of race. As Lois Autry Betts, Associate Professor of Education, Rich Milner investigates the challenges of urban education, of teacher preparation, and especially the issue of race and educational equity. Professor Milner has been on the faculty at Vanderbilt since 2001, shortly after earning his doctorate in educational policy and leadership from Ohio State University. In addition to his work uh, at Peabody, Richard also serves as visiting faculty member in the Division of Social Sciences at Fisk University as I think you all know, a historically black university here in Nashville. Uh, Rich's research focuses on the role that teachers' thinking and beliefs play in the development of language arts and other curricula, on urban education and access to education in urban areas, and on race, culture, and equity in education. He is the editor of the book Race, Ethnicity, and Education, The Influences of Racial and Ethnic Identity in Education, co-author of Teaching Culturally Diverse Gifted Students, and author of many, many peer-reviewed articles. And in a recent article in a journal of theory into practice, he argues that teachers and school leaders must move beyond making excuses to turn around failing schools. But perhaps the best attribute about Rich is that he is someone who walks the talk. He's a dedicated volunteer in the local community Having worked with Nashville YWCA GED program, the YWCA New Start program, the Hadley Park Tutorial Program for students of Pearl Cone High School, Habitat for Humanity, and Room in the In, in, the in Homeless program in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He also advises Association of Black Graduate Students at Peabody. We are really proud to have Rich on the Peabody College faculty. And he is esteemed by others as well as by us. He is a fellow of the Education Policy Research Unit at Arizona State University and the Education and Public Interest Center at the University of Colorado at Boulder. In 2006, it was a very proud moment when he was recognized by the American Educational Research Association with the Scholars of Color in Education Early Career Award. And this spring, he was awarded full tenure and associate professorship at Peabody two years early. So when I said he had lots and lots of publications, he really did have lots and lots of publications. And most importantly, they were very, very impactful. And that's what gets you, credit. That's what gets you promoted at Peabody, is the impact of your work. And there's no one who has had more impact than you, Rich. So I welcome you to, be, to our speaker today. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Now, I'm a Baptist, so when I say good afternoon, I'm used to people responding. So, so I say good afternoon, and you respond by saying, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Camilla, for uh, the great introduction. I want to, uh, to begin. I actually, uh, I actually need about three hours, I think, to really make the points I want to make. But I realize I don't necessarily have that much time, so I, I want to uh, get moving here. I want to start with uh, some brief acknowledgments here so that I make it clear that my thinking has certainly been influenced by a number of different uh, people in a number of, diff of different areas. I want to start by, by recognizing uh, one of the best institutions in this country, uh, The Ohio State University, and the, uh, my major professors, uh, Gail McCutcheon and Anita Wolfock Hoy, uh, and also colleagues from the Department of Teaching and Lear Learning, and I argue the best uh, department of teaching and uh, the best department here at Vanderbilt University. I'm so grateful to my colleagues in the Department of Teaching and Learning, and I say that sincerely. Also, I would like to, to acknowledge and, and recognize uh, the support of the Dean's Office, and in particular, uh, Camilla Benbo, who has been uh, supportive of me and my work since my arrival here uh, at Vanderbilt University. Uh, also, colleagues across the country, I, I want to start by recognizing Margaret Smithy, uh, from the who uh, actually retired uh, from the Department of Teaching and Learning, uh, Donna Ford, uh, Mark Gooden, who is at the University of Cincinnati, John Singer at Texas A&M, Linda Tillman at UNC Chapel Hill, Tyrone Howard at UCLA, Cynthia Dillard and Bob Ransom, who are both at The Ohio State University, Peter Demerath, who is now at the University of, of uh, Minnesota, Sarah Favors and Howitt Davis, who are at South Carolina State University, and also to the many talented graduate students with whom I've worked over the years. Uh, and I want to name just a few. I, I know I'll get myself into trouble by naming, but I, I feel like I really need to name a, a few of these folks. And those people are uh, Julie Winkler Tooley, Nathan Curley, Judson Lauder, F. Blake Tenori, Shanika Williams, who I'm proud to announce is at the University of Georgia now, and Ira Murray. And I also want to recognize and acknowledge the doctoral students over the years who have enrolled in EDUC 3080, uh, Diversity and Equity in Education, and many of those students are in the audience. Thank you for coming. And also uh, my wife, my wonderfully uh, supportive wife, um, Shelley, uh, is here, who is uh, not only my cheerleader, but also a true critic. So after this talk, she's going to tell me exactly um, <laughs> how well I did or not. Uh, so I'm very appreciative to her and also my parents who uh, I just can't say enough about uh, their level of support for me and, my, and also my siblings. I began every talk I give with an African saying, we're all bright folks here, right? So uh, a lot of times we feel like we've, we've actually arrived. And I think one of the things that makes me uh, special uh, is that I, I realize that, that I have work to do. Uh, and so in this work, I'm constantly trying to get better. So the, the saying is, start where you are, but don't stay there. So as we move forward, I hope you will, um, will be open-minded, and hopefully you, uh, perhaps you might learn something uh, in this talk. My research interests. I'm interested, as, as uh, Dean Bimbo uh, mentioned, in how teacher thinking and beliefs influence students' opportunities to learn, how teacher learning can result in the development of instructional practices that enable all students with access and opportunities to succeed in the classroom. And I, and I stress the word all there. And this work has a strong emphasis around matters of race, equity, culture, and more broadly speaking, diversity. I was actually inspired by the talk uh, that Deborah Ball gave several weeks ago. I was going to talk about my work in urban education, but I decided that I was going to instead focus on, uh, on teacher education. I was inspired by, by Dr. Ball, so hopefully I can make some, uh, some connections there. I care deeply about uh, practice. I love theory, but I care very deeply about practice. I attempt to understand and to describe teachers and students' practices and interactions specifically related to matters of diversity. How do teachers' conceptions and beliefs influence students' opportunities to learn? How do teachers' conceptions and beliefs influence students' opportunities to learn? Some of what I've learned quickly, uh, teachers matter. Teachers matter a great deal. Overwhelmingly, teachers have uh, good intentions and can, can make a, and sometimes the, difference uh, in what happens in the classroom. Uh, they want uh, to help students succeed. However, many teachers struggle to understand, or they struggle uh, in understanding how to help all students succeed. 
So they want, they want to help students succeed, but they struggle to understand how to help all students succeed. So if students are not uh, like their own children, let's say, for instance, they struggle to understand how do I get this, this student to a place where he or she can be successful. Not only do teachers matter, but curriculum also matters. So what students have the opportunity to learn actually makes a difference. What is implicit or hidden, and also what is not uh, exposed in the curriculum also makes a difference. I'm reminded of Elliot, Elliot Eisner's work around the no curriculum when I think about um, what's, what's not included. In addition, pedagogy matters. So how the, the, how the curriculum is implemented, how teachers teach the curriculum makes a huge difference. And I argue that the, the, the pedagogy actually uh, matters just as much, if not more, than uh, the curriculum itself. And finally, diversity matters, the diversity of thought of the human condition. That's a deep word when you think about it, and the human condition and experience. And the diversity of teachers, students, and the curriculum and instructional practices all make a huge difference in terms of what happens in schools. Uh, so some uh, important uh, notes around this notion of dilemma. I want us, I want us to broaden our conception of, around what we mean, or around what I mean by diversity dilemmas. Uh, in education and in teacher education. Uh, dilemmas carry negative connotations, or they can, they can carry negative connotations. Synonyms for the term uh, dilemma include quandary, predicament, problem. And I rarely find joy, let's say, for instance, in trying to decide whether or not I want to uh, move my um, investments to a different vehicle during this, this struggling economy, right? In everyday life, we, we, we approach dilemmas in ways that sometimes can bring us um, stress and hardship, if you will. Similarly, teachers in their work often see dilemmas in a light of the negative. So they actually sort of see uh, matters around diversity uh, in ways that, that make them very uncomfortable. So, so they, they, they look at dilemmas as, wow, you know, I don't know if I want to teach in, this, in, in, in a certain type of school, or I don't think I, I'm not sure if I, can, if I will be successful in teaching uh, certain groups of students and so forth. However, dilemmas are what keep us as researchers in business, right? Um, so, uh, and not only in the field of education, but I, I argue that in medicine, sociology, psychology, and so forth, uh, we work to answer questions, to address and solve problems, and simply to figure stuff out. So again, broadening, broadening our conception of what it means, what a dilemma actually means, I think, uh, is important. So I want to argue that uh, we began to see dilemmas or diversity dilemmas in a light of possibility and opportunities. One of the things I know from sh for sure in my work with P12 teachers and my work with P12 students is, is that when uh, teachers start to perceive their culturally diverse students in a light of possibility and opportunity, that real positive outcomes can emerge, rather than perceiving these students as troubled, hopeless, or dilemmas, if you will, to be solved. Thus, uh, let's think of dilemmas as possibilities and opportunities in a, light of po uh, in a, in a, in a positive light, rather than focusing on uh, the negative. Uh, as my grandmother would say, I'm getting ready to tell the truth, and uh, I'm going to tell the truth even if nobody says amen, right? So, so get ready. <laughs> We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile. And mouthed with myriad subtleties, why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them see us while, let, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. I'm getting ready to take the mask off, and I'm getting ready to speak the, group, the truth, as my grandmother would say. Uh, two interrelated arguments I want to make uh, throughout this talk. One argument is that there's a demographic divide dilemma in P12 classrooms that, need to be, that, that needs to be addressed. The second point I want to argue is that there is a teacher prior knowledge beliefs dilemma uh, in teacher education that needs to be addressed as well. Defining diversity, I want to, uh, to, to make it clear that it is not trivial 
um, that there is, it, is, it is not a trivial exercise uh, to attempt, uh, attempting to define uh, what we mean by, by diversity. Uh, it is unclear in uh, education and in teacher education what we mean by diversity. Economists, for instance, uh, don't necessarily have this problem. When they, when they mention terms like diversification, we kind of have an idea of what economists mean, right? They might mean that, um, that one should invest or should, should place uh, money in uh, different vehicles, in different investment vehicles, as opposed to having money placed only in one uh, financial uh, instrument. And education is different, though, and in teacher education is different. So uh, when we talk about diversity, I, I would almost say almost anything could fall under the category of diversity, right? So some people talk about racial diversity. Others talk about ethnic diversity. Other, others focus on linguistic diversity, religion, ability, ableism, social economic status is also included in some studies related to diversity, sexual orientation, gender, Geography, so sometimes we, don't even, we aren't even necessarily talking about people, we're talking about the spaces in which uh, folks live and learn and operate. And we also know that, that these, uh, these different areas, they operate in confluence, right? So uh, they're constantly sort of um, uh, operating at the same time. So uh, one's racial or ethnic background means something, but, but one's uh, gender also, also means something. So I'm an African-American man, right? So the, these factors actually operate in confluence. Argument one, there is a demographic divide dilemma. And this, this issue uh, has broader implications for teacher education. If you, if you look at the, the data here, what you'll notice, and these data are taken from 2003 to 2004, uh, you'll notice that teachers are overwhelmingly white. Um, if, you, if you notice, if you look at the, at the Hispanic Role there, you'll notice that uh, the, the, the Hispanic population of teachers has, is, has actually decreased uh, a bit from 2003 to 2004. Well, recent data actually suggests that the trend is actually reversed. So, so the number of Hispanic uh, teachers are actually, uh, the number is actually uh, increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, and also, if you look at student data, what you see is that uh, teachers are increasingly, I'm sorry, students are increasingly um, non white. So uh, if you look at uh, white student, the white student uh, population, the numbers are uh, decreasing a bit. The black student population is re remaining uh, pretty much stable, and the Hispanic population uh, is actually increasing. Got it? Okay. That's what good teachers do, right? Right? You check to make sure people are with you, right? Uh, and so in, in terms of the U.S. D uh, uh, demographics, in, in 2000, about 28% of students were of color, right? In 2025, about 38, it's projected that about 38% of students will, will be of color. What do you think the projection is for 2050? Okay. Okay, speak out. Okay. More than 50%, right? So, we, so the projection is about 50% uh, of students will be uh, of color. Take a look at this sign. This one is pretty simple, isn't it? What's, the, what, what's on the right side? It's Spanish, right? What does it say? Okay, so that's a bilingual <laughs> sign, right? That's, that one is easy because you have the translation there uh, on the left. Take a look at this one. Help me out. Tacos and fish. Who said that? Okay. Very good. All right. All right. What about this one? We know it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a radio, a radio station, right? Because there's the call number there. Okay. What about this one? I literally take these pictures while I'm driving down the freeway. So. What about this one? This one. Okay. All right. The point I'm making is increasingly so what we're finding is if you are not bilingual, trilingual, if you don't if you speak a, if you don't speak a language other than English, 
um, you may find yourself behind a bit. And this is the case with, um, with, with teachers uh, in teacher education as well. And, and a recurrent issue in the field is whether or not we wait until teachers are born who, are, who speak Spanish, or is it possible for us to prepare students uh, to uh, be effective teachers of all students, right? So that's a recurring, a recurrent issue in the field. About one of six students in, U in the U.S. public schools uh, speaks a language other than English. Between 1991 and 2000, 82 percent of the documented of the documented immigrants came from nations in Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. Currently, where would you say the people? What, what would, where would you say the, the people are coming from? Where are the people coming? Central America is, is a good answer. All right. One more? Yes, good. Okay. So uh, currently, most immigrants who come to the U.S. are from nations in Asia and uh, Latin America. Uh, the demographic divide dilemma. Uh, operate at least on three levels. Teachers and teacher education programs need to be prepared to meet the needs of racially, ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse learners. Teacher education programs need to be more persistent and innovative in the preparation of these teachers for diverse classrooms. And the recruitment and retention of a more diverse teaching force may prove helpful in meeting the growing needs of all learners. I want to, to read just a, a small portion here uh, of, of the, the lecture so that uh, I make sure I get everything in. So bear with me for a minute. Who teachers are in terms of their racial, cultural, socioeconomic, and linguistic backgrounds is an important dilemma because research suggests that the teaching force needs to be more diverse in order to meet the needs of increasingly diverse P-12 students. The demographic divide rationale and imperative is present in an important body of literature that makes the case for the preparation of teachers for the diversity they will face in P-12 educational contexts. However, I am not arguing for a more diverse teaching force at the expense of preparing well-intentioned teachers who are committed to the educational opportunities of all P-12 students. It is imperative to note that while the push for the preparation of teachers for diversity is important, schools are increasingly resegregating. Curriculum theorists Geneva Gay and Tyrone Howard maintain that large numbers of European American and students of color really do not attend schools with each other, nor are different groups of, of color in the same school. Stated differently, when focusing on the student population in P-12 context, discussion often focus on, discussions often focus on the diversity teachers will face in schools. However, many teachers will find themselves in classrooms which are not very diverse at all in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. For instance, many students in urban schools are African American and are Latino American, and teachers must develop the knowledge, skills, attitudes, dispositions, and abilities to teach a diverse group of African American students, a diverse group of white students, a diverse group of Latino students, and so forth. Thus, on a large scale, students are increasingly becoming non-white. Schools in the U.S. are increasingly not actually very diverse in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. Political scientist Gary Orfield explained that the number of black and Latino students in the nation public schools is up by 5.8 million, while the number of white students has declined by 5.6 million. The trend in urban schools is even more profound. In 1998 through 1999, there were 26 cities with more than 60,000 students. These cities enroll 4,715,000 of the nation's 48,392,000 public school students. While about a tenth, that is about 9.74% of all students were enrolled in these districts, the district served only a minute fraction of the nation's white students and a large share of the black and Latino students. These trends in our nation uh, nation schools have demographers suggesting that Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education was never really actualized. 
Because white teachers and students of color can possess different racialized and cultural experiences and repertoires of knowledge and knowing, both inside and outside the classroom, racial and cultural incongruence may serve as roadblocks for academic and social success in the classroom. What teachers believe and come to know about students and their ability and capacity, as well as the decisions they make on these students' behalf, can be important and central to the success of all parties involved. At times, teachers' beliefs, decisions, and actions are in conflict with the experiences and beliefs of their learners, and consequently, there are mismatches between teachers and students which inescapably influence what students have the opportunity to learn. These inconsistencies bring about incongruence, which influences the learning that takes place in the classroom among students. There are few or no commonalities and points of reference to help students and teachers connect. Teachers may rely on stereotypes that they have internalized and learned from uh, the media or from their parents, for instance. Thus, the examples a teacher employs in a lesson, the nature of questions posed, how students are allowed to express themselves, and whose knowledge is validated or not in the classroom, all seem connected to those inconsistencies that exist in the classroom. However, uh, as Geneva Gay asserted, similar ethnicity between students and teachers may be potentially beneficial. It is not a guarantee of pedagogical effectiveness. Instead, there is, a, there is compelling evidence that suggests that teachers from any ethnic background can be successful teachers of culturally diverse students. What are you arguing, Rich? It is what teachers know and have the skills to acquire that makes the difference, not necessarily who the teachers are. Argument two, there is a prior knowledge uh, conceptions dilemma in teacher education that also needs to be addressed. Here I'm talking about what goes on in the preparation of teachers on the classroom level. In higher education, students are encouraged to develop their own conceptions about issues. Uh, the problem is some of their conceptions can be dangerous for the P-12 students with whom they work. So on the one hand, we're in places where, in teacher education where, and in higher education where students uh, are encouraged to develop their own ideas and beliefs about uh, what it means to live, to learn, to function in society. We, in fact, we, we applaud our students for being critical and analytical thinkers, right? But the conflict or the dilemma emerges when uh, you have students who come in with conceptions that are so far outside of what might be advantageous for students that, uh, so there's a tension there in the classroom around what we can do in order to, uh, to work through those. And we also find that we are preparing very bright students to pose tough questions and to rethink what they have come to believe about how the world works uh, is also a challenge, especially uh, when it, it's something, uh, especially when we're, we're forced to, to try and help students uh, understand that their thinking might be quote unquote wrong, right? So my being a black man and talking about these issues certainly complicates matters. Uh, he must have an agenda. This guy has to have an agenda if he's talking about you know, matters of cultural, di cultural diversity. Why is he bringing this up? It's not important. So one concept is the notion of colorblindness that, that we have to address in the teacher education classroom. So teachers sometimes are raised to just see people and to not think about race or culture. And I think this is a noble uh, sort of um, position to take in a lot of ways. I think it would be wonderful if we could live in a world where uh, one didn't necessarily have to, to focus on race or to have to focus on culture. It would be outstanding. Uh, this thinking carries over into their conceptions of what they should do as teachers. Assertion one, if I acknowledge the racial or ethnic background of my students or myself, then I may be considered a racist. Assertion two, if I admit that people experience the world differently, I may be seen as politically correct. Uh, I may offend others in the teacher education classroom discourse, discourse if I express my beliefs and reservations about race. Assertion three, I should treat all my students the same, regardless of who they are, 
what their home situations are or what their experiences happen to be. Again, there's an equity means sameness dilemma that we constantly have to address in the teacher education classroom. And this goes again, go, it, this can actually go against uh, what they've learned of come to believe in their lives uh, as people in general. Voices of teachers. One teacher reported, the articles brought to my attention issues that I did not know existed. This is uh, essentially at the end of the class, several years ago, I asked students to uh, talk with me about their thinking about the course. And it was, it was uh, th this particular work was uh, more so around my coming to understand how to improve my work uh, with teachers. So the, 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 the student reported, the articles brought to my attention issues that I did not know existed. The hard part about the articles was trying to change views I have had my entire life. Another student explained, well, I know that my understandings of diversity have changed because I think very early on I was confronted with racism, particularly from my mother. She was a very prejudiced lady, and I know that that influenced me early on. The research suggests that on a classroom level, it is critical that teachers recognize students' racial and ethnic backgrounds in order to plan for, work with, and teach more complete Students, rather than uh, focusing on or attempting to work with fragmented, incomplete folks, it matters that I'm a black man. It matters in my daily experiences. It matters when I drive down the freeway. It matters when I walk in the supermarket. It matters to me. So, uh, uh, and, and, but, it, but, but it doesn't necessarily matter to everybody. As, as multicultural educational researcher James Banks asserted, a statement such as, I don't see color, reveals a privileged position that refuses to legitimize racial identifications that are very important to people of color and that are often used to justify inaction and the perpetuation of the status quo. On a policy level, the, ad the, the adoption of uh, colorblind ideologies make it difficult to recognize systemic, broader disparities and dilemmas in education such as an overrepresentation of students of color in special education, an underrepresentation of students of color in gifted education, an over-referral of African American students to the office, an overwhelming number of African Americans being, uh, being expelled or suspended from school. So if we approach these data without uh, a, a cultural or racial lens, we might believe uh, that surely it is the students themselves who cause themselves to end up in these situations and, and not our perfectly flawless policies and procedures that might need to be called into question. Get it? Okay. Another conceptual challenge, the notion of meritocracy. And this has to do with the idea that people are rewarded based solely or mostly on their ability, their performance, and their talents. Assertion one. All groups of people were born with the same opportunities. And that if students or people just worked harder, put forth more effort, and followed the law, then, like a formula, they will be successful. Uh, quite often, success stories such as those of Oprah Winfrey, Tom Cruise, or Will Smith are used as examples to, from rags to, so they're rags, rags to riches stories, right? These folks made it, so uh, certainly all students can and there are no other barriers. Assertion two, if students do not succeed, it is because they are not working hard enough, not because of other factors that may be outside of their control. Voices of teachers. I get so sick of people, really she was talking about me, making something out of nothing. My, grandparent, <laughs> my grandparents immigrated to this country uh, with nothing, and they made something of their lives because they worked hard. Another teacher, uh, sorry, and I recognize as Beverly, as curriculum theorist Beverly Gordon asserted, it is difficult for a group of people or an individual to critique and work to change the world when the world works for that group of people or for that individual. I'm going to say it again. It is difficult for a group of people or an individual to critique and work to change the world when the world works for that group of people or for that individual. I know I'm right about that. Another student reported, I'm going to be the kind of teacher who follows your advice, Dr. Milner, and have high expectations. If a student is not turning in his homework on time, I'm not going to give any slack. It's going to be a zero in my grade book. 
no conceptions or ideas to try, to under, try and understand what might be happening with the, with the student uh, around his not turning in that work is, um, is a problem, is, a, is problematic. Research implications. Teachers need to recognize that factors beyond ability, talent, effort, and hard work can contribute to students' academic and social success. If the meritocracy argument were completely accurate, soci sociologist James Henslin wrote, all positions would be awarded on the basis of merit. If so, ability should predict who goes to college. Instead, family income is the best predictor. The more family earns, the more likely their children are to go to college. While some people do get ahead through ability and hard work, others simply inherit wealth and the opportunities that go with it. In short, factors far beyond merit give people their positions in society. In short, factors far beyond merit give people their positions in society. Oh, I was supposed to read, wasn't I? Okay. This one is shorter. The meritocracy argument, argument may actually be a myth because the meritocracy argument maintains that any person living in the U.S. society uh, can reach the American dream as long as that person works hard, puts forth effort, follows the law, and makes good decisions. This theory rejects institutionalized and systemic issues that permeate policies and practices such as racism, sexism, classism, and discrimination. Moreover, the meritocracy argument does not take into consideration social and cultural reproduction that wealthier students often inherit, those things that are inherited materially, resourcefully, physically, socially, and culturally. I am referring to the capital that has been and continues to be passed down from one generation to the next. In essence, as social scientist Jay McLeod explained, Schools and policies may actually reinforce social inequality while pretending to do the opposite. I'll say it again. Schools and policies may actually reinforce social inequality while pretending to do the opposite. Another conception, teaching, teachers' thinking and, and, and beliefs. Uh, teachers approach their work concentrating on what students do not have rather than focusing on what students bring into the learning environment, rather than focusing on their assets. Trust me, students are coming in the classroom with something. I've come to understand in my work in P12, I work in urban spaces, students are coming in that classroom with something. They're coming in with a, with a wealth of knowledge, with a broad range of knowledge. And it may not be the knowledge that we find to be uh, uh, appropriate or we, may, we, or we find to be um, uh, uh, as accepting or as, uh, as valid or credible uh, as we might want. But they're coming in, that, in those spaces with something. And so it's the teacher's responsibility then to try uh, and build on that knowledge. And then teachers have a narrow view of what it means to be normal. I have a very narrow view of what it means to be normal or successful. I can't tell you the number of times people look at me and say, you're a professor, right? And I, and I often, and, and, and I know it has something to do with my youthful good looks. Uh, <laughs> but I also, I also, I, 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 it's, it's troubling in that, you know, is there a certain way that a professor has to be or act, right? Other than being morally um, and, and ethically um, stellar, right? Are there, are there not other ways of being a, a professor? So there, there's a narrow view of what it means to be, to be normal. These views are based on their own cultural references that may be inconsistent with others. And then they also, uh, it's just what I actually call, I've started to call now, uh, I, I used to call this construct in my work deficit thinking and beliefs, but I've since started to call it, call it the catch-up approach, the catch-up approach, right? So they spend all of their energy talking about an achievement gap. Assertion one. I'm, I'm being sensitive to culturally diverse students when I feel sorry for them. If I expect too much, then I'm setting the students up for failure. Assertion two, students need teachers who try to make up for what they're lacking and not necessarily those who build on what students have because some students bring so little. Again, focusing on what students don't bring, they're bringing something in there, but focusing on what students don't bring um, is the problem. Assertion three, it is my job to concentrate mostly 
on students' test scores and to close the achievement gap. Voices of teachers. Uh, one student uh, at the end of, the, of, of this particular class questioned me about whether or not I actually always saw myself as a black male. And we had talked about Claude Stills, who's at Stanford University, his notion of stereotype threat. And she said, I kept pushing you to speak whether there were times when you could forget, you know, who you are in the sense that you didn't wonder, worry, if it wasn't in the back of your mind that someone was seeing you as a black man. To me, the great experience was you, or your saying, uh, your ability to just state without any wavering on it at all that you always see yourself as black. So the student was saying, Rich, why don't you just forget about that blackness piece and just focus on all that? And so, and, and, but, but her conception was that it was a negative, right? So the idea that, um, that I can see myself as, as black, as American, as male, as professor, as husband, as son, right? You know, all these things, again, run in confluence. It was a negative in her sight. So, so in other words, she was saying, can't you just forget about that part of who you are? Let's just be American. Just forget about that piece, right? Deficit. A male student uh, reported, I want to dedicate my career, his whole career, this is what he wants to dedicate his career to, to closing the achievement gap between white students and Hispanics and white students and blacks. Research implications. Teachers water down the curriculum and or lower their expectations because they feel sorry for students, or because they believe the students are not capable of academic success. So there's an empathy versus sympathy dilemma that we constantly deal with. Teachers rely on what someone else has determined to be important to teach, and they teach down to students. They rarely allow students opportunities to have voice or perspective in the classroom because they have made up in their minds that students are lacking what they need to be uh, to contribute to the classroom discourse and knowledge construction. They believe students do not have what it takes to be academically successful. Teachers are fascinated by and intrigued with a perceived achievement gap. And I say perceived here because researchers are consistently now starting to question whether or not or to the extent that an achievement gap actually exists. If you have not read already, you should take a look at past president uh, and anthrop uh, educational anthropologist Gloria Lassen Billings' piece on the education debt. And she talks about how we need to change our perception around whether or not there is actually an achievement gap as much as there are these other gaps that exist that cause us or that make, that, that make us believe that there's actually an achievement gap. Educational psychologist and um, teacher educator Jackie Irvine says what we really need to do is move beyond this, this achievement gap focus and focus on the other gaps, such as the teacher quality gap, the teacher training gap, the challenging curriculum gap, the school funding gap, the digital divide gap, the wealth and income gap, the employment opportunity gap, the affordable housing gap, the health care gap, the nutrition gap, the school integration gap, and the quality child care gap. In other words, what she's saying is if we spend all of our time trying to, um, trying to get students to catch up, remember I said it's the catch up approach, then we're going to find ourselves really not moving very far. If you think about it, uh, students, of, uh, students who are, in the, in the, who are, who are scoring the highest on these, these, these exams, we're not, we don't want them to stay where they are, do we? So while we're trying to catch these other students up, we're hoping that, the, that our brightest students will continue to move forward as well, right? So if we spend all of our time trying to catch these students up with the students who are here, what's going to happen to these students? We're going to say run in place or let's go into a holding pattern so that we can catch these students who are beneath you up? You get what I'm saying? So in other words, the, the notion that there is an achievement gap needs to be uh, problematized. And I know my colleagues here and across the country probably disagree with me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, another conceptual uh, dilemma. So we also find ourselves, oh, I gotta, I gotta really uh, hurry. We also find ourselves, I told you I needed three hours, three hours, just three hours. We also find ourselves in places where uh, students sometimes, uh, real, we, we, we might reinforce stereotypes uh, in our work. Uh, there is this dilemma of reinforcing stereotypes between um, relative to different groups of students, their parents, and their experiences. Assertion one, all Asian students are stellar students. They are the model minority student uh, group. 
Assertion two, uh, two, I refuse to think about any features of culturally diverse students because I cannot say for sure that every student from that group is the same. I want, to take, want us to take a look here at um, a quick um, slide that I used in one of my courses. And my intent was to get my students to a point where they, were, where they started to think about how to develop uh, parent-teacher relationships. So that was my intent. Right? And I want you, as you're watching this clip, I want you to think about some of the stereotypes that emerged from this clip. Okay? So you, you with me? All right, I need feedback. You with me? Oh, okay, good. All right. All right, so, so what are some stereotypes that you think might, might have been reinforced from that, from that clip? Just call them out quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, A single mom, right? Okay, good. Violent neighborhood. Violent neighborhood, absolutely. Okay, one more. No discipline, right? Okay, all right, very good. So uh, thank you, good comment, good comment. Uncaring teacher, right? Uh, and so uh, my point in, in sharing this in the, in the class was to sort of unpack some of the positives and negatives sort of inherent in the, in the teacher-parent uh, uh, conversation. But I cannot tell you how many, uh, how, how many stereotypes were actually reinforced from that clip. Take a look at the second one. So Trey has gone now to, to live with his father. And in this clip, what I was trying to stress is that parents sometimes um, when we think about the lack of parental involvement from, from some parents, we often um, uh, frown upon why parents aren't involved. So we might say, why and how in the world might a parent not um, be very much involved in his or her parent, his or her child's education? Uh, and the idea is, and so, so, I was, so I was playing this clip to, to, to get at um, why some parents decide not to actually become as involved in, in the education of their students.
So the point, the point I, I wanted to make uh, here was to say that some, some parents uh, sort of view their, their role in their children's lives as economic, right, as an economic uh, resource. So as Furious says to Trey, he says, all I got to do is put clothes on your back, put shoes on your feet, and put uh, food on the table, right? So, so what, I was, what I wanted to explain from that clip was that uh, it's the teacher's responsibility, part of the teacher's responsibility, to sort of change that conception, to say, wow, you know, if we work together, if you work with Trey on his homework three or four hours a night, if you come into the school, we can develop this partnership and so forth. Didn't work. Instead, there were all these stereotypes, again, that uh, sort of emerged from my great intentioned uh, example here uh, from the clip. So you can think of probably three or four stereotypes that probably that could have emerged from uh, that clip, clip from the students, right? Okay, good. The work we do in teacher education can have an influence on students, the children in P12 classrooms. And I argue that we do this work of preparing teachers with what Banks calls the head and the heart. Preparing teachers, teachers for diversity is difficult yet necessary. I believe we must seriously change the way we prepare teachers in teacher education. Our department is with the leadership of our program direct, directors working to do just that. The work of teacher education and teacher educators is perhaps some of the most difficult work of all. Perhaps this is why I enjoy it so much. Again, I see the possibility inherent in dilemmas. I think we need to continue addressing the dilemmas in teacher education. We should study them using different research tradi traditions. I think of what we should avoid being arrogant about how we come to understand and know what we know about the work of teachers. I think if, if one research tradi tradi tradition uh, were so, uh, it was so much more superior to another, we would know a lot more. So I reject this notion of us, them binaries in terms of, of uh, studying what's happening in the field. I have attempted to argue that we broaden our conceptions of what it means to have a dilemma. I've attempted to argue that we address the demographic divide dilemma in P12 classrooms, and I've attempted to, uh, to argue that we address the teacher prior knowledge, beliefs, concept dilemma in teacher education for the sake of their P12 practices. Thank you. That's always a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> always a bad sign. Yes. Uh, so I think one of the one of the beliefs that underlies most of the research that we do in college is that individual differences matter. But that unit of analysis, by allowing us to measure a certain class of things and not others, allowing us to entertain a certain class of possible explanations for dilemmas and not others, may really get in our way. Mm -hmm. Do you have another proposal for a unit of analysis? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. You know, I, I definitely think uh, that the individual level of analysis is important. Um, but I also believe that uh, the milieu, the, the cultural uh, environment in which practice happens matters quite significantly. So um, I would definitely say for sure, without a doubt, that in, even in our analyses when we talk about the individual differences, that we take into consideration uh, the, the cultural space, if you will, that shape how people come to know, how people live and how people learn uh, in, uh, in the classroom and beyond. One more? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Well, I mean, I think uh, there, there are multiple ways I could, uh, could approach that, uh, the, the, the question. The first thing I try to do in my work is to, to make clear uh, my role in, uh, in being a reflective practitioner. Uh, and so I'm, I'm constantly